I'm David Torsivia. I'm Daniel Forkner. And this is Ashes, Ashes, a show about systemic issues, cracks in civilization, collapse of the environment, and if we're unlucky, the end of the world. But if we learn from all of this, maybe we can stop that. The world might be broken, but it doesn't have to be. Landlords have been set up to take advantage and exploit tenants. That is the role that they've been put in. And it's not necessarily, they didn't just wake up one day like, oh, I want to go oppress some people. Um, That's not how our system works, right? They inherited some property or they just decided that this was the way that they're going to guarantee their retirement or whatever. Um, And that put them in an economic position where they have control over another person's housing situation and their interests are contradictory to that of a tenant. It's like your boss at a job is always going to have interests that are contradictory to yours. No matter how nice of a person they are, at some point, what you need to survive is going to go up against how they make their income. Today, 50% of poor families in the U.S. spend half of their income on rent. And 25% of poor families spend 70% of their income on rent, leaving little to nothing left over for basic necessities like food, health care, and transportation. As we'll get to Tenants are pushing back against the tactics landlords are using to keep them in precarity. But landlords themselves are utilizing their own techniques to enforce this status quo. This includes things like aggressive lobbying and political spending efforts. In fact, realtors spent three quarters of a million dollars late last year to defeat a ballot initiative in Santa Cruz, California. And in California, a statewide bill, Prop 10, that would have made it easier for local municipalities to regulate rental prices was defeated after investment firms, including Blackstone, spent $74 million to fight it. In 2016, landlords and other real estate firms raised over $250 million in political contributions, more than double what was raised by oil and gas. But these fights are not exclusive to the U.S., David. Uh, Just a few days ago, tens of thousands of people marched in cities across Germany in protest against out-of-control rental prices and gentrification, making it cost-prohibitive simply to live with a roof overhead. (laughs) So this is a show about housing, David. But, you know, there's so much that could be said about housing and the many, many relationships that go into uh, creating the housing market. So we're just going to spend in this introductory episode, which we're going to have to come back to this topic time and time again, we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about the relationship between landlords and their tenants, specifically, mostly landlords of big apartment buildings. And you know, this, this topic is something that's been gaining traction. Like you mentioned, something that's been hitting the news and in, in all the political struggles. Um, there was a segment on the John Oliver show just a couple of days ago in which he describes a little bit of the exploitative and almost criminal relationship that landlords of mobile home parks have with their renters, where you have these big investment companies that have been buying up these mobile home parks all across the country. And the whole strategy is based on the fact that you can derive profit from a tenant that has no choice to go anywhere else. Because the way that they structure these deals is it's not a typical renting situation where you know a person is renting a mobile home from a landlord. What they're actually doing is purchasing the rental home. So the family owns the mobile home, but what they're doing is they're renting the land underneath it. Of course, if the landlord decides to raise the rent on that land, it's not so easy for the poor you know, family to just spend $5,000 or whatever it is to relocate their home. And this is something that has come out that these landlords have been discussing in, in meetings and seminars as the intent behind their strategy to say, look, these people cannot go. They're effectively prisoners in this home. So we can get away with raising whatever price we want. And there's nothing they can do about it. And if they can't pay, well, maybe they can sell some plasma. Maybe they can sell some blood because it's not our problem. And of course, last week, David, when we were talking about facial tracking, uh, it came up that landlords in New York City intentionally track the tenants that are in their rent controlled buildings for various reasons, you know, to kick them out or to control them in some way to generate profit. This is a topic that so many people in the United States and abroad can relate to. 
this relationship between a landlord and the tenant. And so this is something we're going to explore a little bit. And we will be joined later in this episode by Claire, an activist and organizer in California, uh, specifically in Santa Cruz. Which is why we had to mention that little Santa Cruz fact right there. And it's really worth sticking around to hear this interview. Claire did such a great job articulating things that I couldn't have said better myself, David, I don't know about you, but but I was just really impressed and inspired by their perspective. And so we'll get to that. But David, there's two papers that we're going to be just briefly going through before we get to that interview. One comes out of Georgia State University here in my city of Atlanta, and another one um, that came out of Boston both uh, this year. Well, let's look at some of this this stuff, Daniel. I started this episode by listing out just how much of people's income is going to rent. And it's a huge, staggering sum. I mean, what did I say? 50% for a lot of people, uh, 70% of total income going to rent alone for large portions of the American population. I mean, this is a staggering problem. And this trend, unfortunately, has just been getting worse as time goes on. As the number of low-income people demanding low-cost housing has risen, and this is because of things that we talk about on this show, these sources of economic inequality, well, the supply of low-cost housing has at the same time fallen due to a lack of federal funding for housing support. Between 2005 and 2015, the share of low-income families receiving housing support fell by 3%, which doesn't sound like a lot, but these are huge amounts of people who are now facing these difficult decisions of, well, do I buy things like insulin or food or continue to put a roof over my head? At the same time, apartment construction and renovations of old buildings focused on high-end renters, these so-called luxury rehabilitations of apartments. And this results in higher rent, which is a heavy burden for these low-income families. 19% of renters in the U.S. in 1999 allocated more than half their income to rent, but by 2015, that had risen to 25% of renters. And at the same time, divestment of older buildings means that many are becoming unlivable. And so it's getting harder and harder for uh, a large group of the population in the United States to afford housing. More and more people are spending the majority of their income just to have a roof over their head, which makes them financially insecure. And for these reasons and more, eviction is a dark cloud that hangs over the heads of so many people. So This one paper out of Georgia State University, it examines all 43 large owners of apartment buildings in Atlanta, each owning more than five large apartment communities and together controlling 33% of the market and 120,000 units. So these are big players. And the paper looks at how these landlords employ a certain practice called serial eviction filings. And this is a process in which evictions are filed on the same tenant over and over and over again by the same landlord on a tenant living in the same unit. And often the landlord's intent in this practice is not even to remove the tenant at all. But before we get into why this is going on and the significance of this, I think it's important to point out just how awful eviction is, David. I don't know if you've ever faced an eviction notice before, but For anyone who's experienced an eviction or the threat of eviction, it's very serious because this is something that goes on your permanent record, so to speak. It can impact your ability to rent in the future. And if you're already in a financially insecure situation, this can, you know, exacerbate that to new levels. Well, Daniel, I've been fortunate enough not to have to face an eviction notice yet, but I have worked with people who have, and it is terrifying. I I mean, the legal struggles and the complications aside, but just knowing that you're home might not be yours for much longer and having to deal with that is uh, catastrophic. And not just to the renters themselves, but to their family members, whether they have direct children or something, or their indirect family who might have to support them in this time of difficulties coming forward. Did you see the cat thing? I sent it to like a bunch of people. No. It, It broke my heart. There was this tweet the other day that this cat was left in front of this PetSmart and then somebody from the PetSmart who worked there came in at like seven and they found the cat. And it, it was like in a in a carrying case, and this person worked for like the ASPC or some sort of animal organization, and uh, so they took it and they took it there to be adopted. But it, it had a note tucked into it that was written by like this child. Oh my god! I just got to read it because it's the saddest thing I've ever. Okay, here's what the note said. <clears throat> At the top, it says Tigger boy, and it's very clearly written by this child, which 
um, makes it harder to read. But my name is Tigger. I'm two years old. My family got evicted with 24 hours notice. I am an indoor cat. I like people, but get scared easily. I like to get petted sometimes. I get nervous when I get picked up. I'm sweet and never bit anyone. I'm even scared of mice. I'm 75% Persian and 25% tabby. My family is sad. Please find me a good home. Don't let nothing happen to me. I have not had my shots because I was indoor. I'm scared of outside and I will hide. I know my name very good. If you read this note, please give it to somebody that can help me. I also like to talk. Do not euthanize, please. He's a perfectly good cat. He is young, only two. Um, and this note was like tucked in in the, just the corner of this cat carrier. And the cat is the saddest looking cat I've ever seen. Like its eyes it just has these sad cat eyes. But I mean, <sighs> this story is so sad for me because first off, I'm a, a cat person and a sucker yeah. for cats. But I mean, like this, this kid... Like, what kid needs to, first off, be forced to give up their pet that they very clearly love so much? But, like, based on their handwriting, what, they're, like, 8 or 10, maybe, if that. And they they have all these words that they shouldn't need to know yet, you know, evicted, euthanized. And they're giving up this thing that they love so much because of this landlord. You know, I recognize my own privilege in that story because my relationship with, you know, landlords and, and renting and apartments have really just been, you know, I move when I when it's convenient for me, when I want to go somewhere, but it's never been this situation of like I feel torn from my own home. And yeah, it it's it's hard it's heartbreaking to think about how, you know, from the landlord's perspective, they think they're just making a business decision, but on the other side of that is a whole family, a child, relationships that that are affected in a big way. And these these evictions are of course uh one of the major drivers of those uh separations. Yeah, and, and we can look at some of these these stats because evictions absolutely do lead to a lot of problems. Um, the effects can be homelessness, job loss, school turnover, deteriorated health, and even mental illness. All of these have been linked back directly to evictions. It's one of the most stressful things that can happen to somebody in their lives, and it can spiral out from there. Uh, this is all from a paper called Multifamily Evictions, Large Owners, and Serial Filings, Findings from Metropolitan Atlanta, March 2019. Mm-hmm. That is a mouthful. Yeah, so you mentioned job loss, for example. The stats on that is those who are evicted from their homes have between 11 and 25% chance of losing their jobs. And of course, that has consequences. But the eviction itself can push families, quote, down market. And that means those who get evicted statistically wind up in neighborhoods with a 5.4 increased poverty rate and a 2% higher crime rate, which of course, this adds even more instability to their lives, puts further positive pressure on that poverty feedback loop. And of course, we'll talk about how this relationship with the landlord, these practices of evictions and the exploitative types of things that we'll talk about a little bit later, really cause problems for someone that, are, that can be completely out of control. But you know what, David, as someone who came from a real estate background, I want to share something I found from a website called biggerpockets.com. And this is a website dedicated to helping people become landlords. The whole idea is, hey, you want bigger pockets? You want passive income? Let's form this community together of landlords who are investing in single family properties or apartment buildings. And let's talk shop. Let's talk strategies. You know, let's talk about how to optimize your financial plan to kick these tenants' butt and get that money, that mailbox money. And I found a thread where someone asked, do you investors accept a tenant if they've ever had an eviction on their record? Right, And and because this is something I want to emphasize. When you get evicted, when you get that filing, when you go to court, when a landlord kicks you out, it goes on your permanent record. And anytime you try to apply to rent at a new place, I mean, this is on your credit score. Any prospective landlord is going to know. So let's let's hear straight from them. What do they think about renting to someone with an eviction? Let's trade these off, David, because uh, I wrote these down. Um, this is one that I'm calling the patronizer. This is Larry from Rochester, New York. Quote, I would take a tenant with a prior eviction, but I'd be looking for some combination of a good explanation. Why things will be different now. A solid income and maybe first month, last month and security check up front. You see, in my experience, most tenants want to pay the rent. They really do. They may be terrible money managers and not make rent a priority, 
or they may hit hard times, but they want to pay. That knowledge helps us remember that they are real people, good people. I'm not their family. I can't be there to catch everybody when they fall. I'm not social services. I will evict. And I have to run this like a business. But I won't just write them off because of an eviction without the consideration. You know, I think Larry, you know, is actually not too bad, David. Where, where are you reading these from? I can't find this. Oh, they're in the Discord. Uh, okay. And this is Kyle, a property investor from Northern California. One of my main criteria for applicants is no prior evictions. I do not accept anyone with a prior eviction history, period. I've had numerous calls from prospective applicants who wanted to give me a sad story about how them being evicted wasn't their fault, but how am I to know whether they're telling the truth or not? And I certainly don't want to waste my time investigating their claims that it was all the prior landlord's fault. Plus, once they've been through the eviction process once, they already know too much about how the process works. And more importantly, the delay tactics that they can use to continue living in your property for free. Here's one uh, that I'm calling the once a criminal, always a criminal. This comes from Doug living in New York. He says, I personally believe that if anyone has a history of doing something, then their chances of doing it again rise dramatically when compared to someone who doesn't have a history doing that same something. If a prospective tenant is honest about a previous eviction, then it is commendable. (laughs) However, as a landlord, you want to do everything you can to ensure you receive rent each month. If you have to evict a tenant, then you are in a terrible situation. It means they are not paying you, but are still living in your property. This costs you money. Well, how about this one, Daniel, the not falling for it? So this is Ali, an investor from New Jersey. They'll always blame the landlord. The most common reason I've heard is that their landlord didn't make repairs, so they stopped paying rent. As Kyle also said, once they've been through it, they know how it works, how much time they have, and they have no fear about going through it again. Um, final one I want to highlight, and I think this one really shows the mindset behind some of these. Um, this is Matthew Olzak, a realtor from Illinois, basically explaining how the, the threat of eviction is a useful way to put fear in your tenant. And if they've already had an eviction, well, here, let me, I'll just read what he has to say. I don't want to give it away. Quote, too many other candidates with less risky borderline traits that I'd rather take a chance on. A huge deterrent to reaching the point of an eviction is a tenant's fear. Where will they live with an eviction on their record? What will happen to their stuff? Will they be publicly shamed? Etc. For someone who has already been through it and been evicted, they likely are more comfortable and familiar with the process and as such aren't afraid it'll happen. I don't care about the circumstances. I don't care how long ago it was. I don't care what has changed in their life. If I find someone was evicted, it's an instant and easy no. Well, that doesn't make these landlords look very good. And the the reason I wanted to quote those is just to point out how difficult it could be for someone who might have this on their record. And, And it reminds me of something that Michelle Alexander wrote in The New Jim Crow. Michelle Alexander is writing about how to this day, minorities in the United States are still discriminated against from so much of our, our social structure, from accessing so much and how they're still criminalized. And she brings up this point about public housing and how you know public housing exists ostensibly right to give disadvantage or those stuck in poverty a place to live, a place to call home, a place that they can afford. But as she writes, quote, the Supreme Court ruled in 2002 that Under federal law, public housing tenants can be evicted regardless of whether they had knowledge of or participated in alleged criminal activity. According to the court, William Lee and Barbara Hill were rightfully evicted after their grandsons were charged with smoking marijuana in a parking lot near their apartments. Herman Walker was properly evicted as well after police found cocaine on his caregiver. And Perley Bucker was rightly evicted following the arrest of her daughter for possession of cocaine a few blocks from home. The court ruled these tenants could be held civilly liable for the nonviolent behavior of their children and caregivers. They could be tossed out of public housing due to no fault of their own. <clears throat> now, when I read this, David, this just absolutely blew my mind. You're telling me that in the United States today, an elderly woman living her life in, in public housing in an affordable place 
can be thrown out with force because her own grandson got charged with a nonviolent drug, you know, drug charge a block away. This is just crazy to me, but it kind of puts into perspective how unproportional those landlords now sound to be so cold and to say, look, I don't care the circumstances. Well, you were evicted. Well, you're not renting from me. Just imagine the situation some of these people might find themselves when that eviction came. I mean, a lot of, for a lot of people, public housing is, is a, a, a point of last resort, right? And the idea that they could have this eviction on their permanent record through no fault of their own and then find themselves forever locked out of housing. Well, I mean, speaking of Michelle Alexander, and of course, that is an absolutely amazing book. Everyone should be out there reading it. Uh, but unsurprisingly, research has shown that eviction rates do climb as the percentage of black populations in an area climb. And even worse than this, black women are targeted disproportionately high, although the number of children present in a neighborhood results in higher eviction rates regardless of race, if that stat couldn't get any worse. And then, of course, you know, parents who are evicted, there are market health problems that can result with children. It significantly raises the risk of homelessness for the whole family. And I mentioned that this paper studied the role of landlords in Atlanta, these large landlords, and the practice of something called serial eviction filings. And this is where the story actually gets a little bit darker because at least those individual landlords that we quoted, David, they just didn't want to rent to somebody who they considered a risk. And in our current economic structure, maybe we can only criticize them so much. But what if someone is using eviction as a exploitative tool to generate more revenue by profiting off of the vulnerability that someone finds themselves in. And this is what this paper found, that some landlords start the eviction process. And that process looks different depending on the state you're in, but this process repeats itself. And it's when a landlord starts that eviction process not to remove the tenant, because in a lot of ways, this creates a cost for the landlord. Now their unit is vacant. They might have to do some maintenance. They're going to have to go without rent for a month or two. So instead, they use this as a way to get additional income because it allows them to tack on late fees, which are now enforceable through these eviction filings. What this means is that when the serial eviction filing process is employed, the victims of that will experience a regular 22% increase in their housing cost a fact that the researchers call in their paper a, quote, effective premium that tenants pay through late fees, representing a systematic penalty that the lightly regulated rental market inflicts on those who are economically fragile, not dissimilar from the interest rate penalties that subprime lenders inflict on those with previous credit challenges. And so basically, to summarize, what's going on is these very large landlords have realized that, look, we have all these tenants, they're vulnerable, they don't want eviction notices on their record. They don't want to be evicted from their place. So what we're going to do is make it very easy for them to fail to pay rent on time, or we're just going to um, employ this automated software to catch any time they slip up, and then we will automatically start an eviction process. They'll get a letter on their door, and they'll say, we have filed eviction on uh, eviction notice on you, and we've tacked on these late fees. And the tenant will feel powerless so often to do anything to fight that because the sooner they can stop that eviction filing, the better off they'll be. So a lot of them just go ahead and do it. And this trend is only going to get worse because we're seeing a consolidation of these large landlords that are taking over the market. Between 2002 and 2012, the largest landlords in the country went from 22% control of the rental market to 32%. And unsurprisingly, these larger landlords file evictions at a 68% higher rate than smaller owners. Okay, well, that's, that's a lot of, of rambling a little bit there, Daniel, and I hope we haven't lost anybody in this. Uh, but I, I mean, evictions, it's easy to get us passionate about that and easy to say, you know, obviously, uh, we don't want people to being forced out of their homes. But, you know, some of us listening right now may be saying, well, maybe landlords are sometimes justified in this. Uh, there's a contract there. It's a social contract as well as a physical contract. If you're not paying your rent, well, you shouldn't be living in the apartment. And though we may not all agree with that fact uh, or maybe more complicated than it looks like just right on the surface, this ultimately begs the question of, well, you know, if these poor people are getting evicted, why can they not pay the rent? Why does the rent keep going up? And why are the circumstances leading 
to this increase in evictions? Mm. Yeah, that's a really good question because at the end of the day, someone could say, okay, just because evictions are going up doesn't necessarily mean that the landlords are doing something wrong. Maybe it's the tenants that are doing something wrong. And that's why I really wanted to discuss this second paper. It's called Do the Poor Pay More for Housing? Exploitation, Profit, and Risk in Rental Markets. Um, It was written by two researchers, one out of MIT, one out of Stanford. They start out the paper with kind of uh, going through the history, at least in the past 60 to 80 years, of the sociological lens through which we look at inequality, at least here in the West, in the United States, and how we define inequality in the places we look for the sources of that inequality. In the 70s, it was popular to assume individual characteristics described inequality. From the paper, quote, social disparities came to be understood as the result of variation in individual characteristics without much reference to relationships between people, collectives, or organizations. Thus, a father's occupational status was reinterpreted as an attribute belonging to the son, whose success in the labor market had less to do with the behavior of employers than with his own attributes. And we've talked about this before, David, how in the 70s, we had this massive trend of individualization, kind of going away from the societal view of things. But then this kind of went the other way. In the 80s, there was a book that came out that kind of captured a new perspective on how social structures might explain economic inequality. And again, here's from the paper, quote, Another body of work referenced large-scale social and economic dislocations as the source of inequality, end quote. And the idea was that, well, maybe the, the social structures of racism and the economic transformation of America resulted in racial inequality and the urban poverty that we were seeing at that time. But this didn't quite tell the whole story either, because this kind of assumes that poverty these renters who are having trouble paying rent, these things kind of just emerge by the way we just happen to be structured as a society. But then a new perspective kind of took hold in the late 90s. And this was expressed in a book called Durable Inequality. And the idea was that inequality might actually be a result of the social relations between people, specifically exploitative relations in which one group directly profits from the impoverishment of another, as opposed to the idea that poverty just emerges unintentionally. Now, it's not to say that this was like a new discovery. Certainly, people had thought this before, but it was just a popular perspective in sociology at the time. And it's a little bit ridiculous, I think, David, that, you know, here we are in 2019, and it took researchers from Stanford and MIT 50 years to to tell us that inequality is a result of exploitation and that landlords exploit their tenants, which is really what this paper is about. In a way, it's almost insulting, right? Like Mm -hmm. (laughs) you don't need, uh, you know, a a big Stanford uh, researcher to tell you that. All you got to do is just ask a tenant that's in a vulnerable and exploitative situation, hey, does your landlord exploit you? And they'll tell you. It's funny you mentioned that because this sort of idea has appeared so many times on this show. Uh, Recently on that philanthropy episode we did where Bill Gates had to spend a billion dollars researching what parents, teachers, and students already knew and could have told them, but it had to be formalized, uh, quantified, and explained so that you could measure it all out. At the cost of time, at the cost of this huge amount of money, at the cost of lives lost in this process while this is all being researched. And the same thing is here. I mean, any tenant knows innately that this is true, that they're being exploited, and that's why they're being caught in this system. Uh, there's, it's not even a, a, a difficult concept. It's not a concept that, that you have to talk to tenants about. All sorts of political philosophy has been written about this. Um, I mean, I don't want to pull out my little red book and like turn to Mao for a second. But I mean, a lot of what happened in China around that was centered around just how exploitative landlords were. And that's why so many ended up being uh, brutally murdered. But these ideas are not new. Fundamentally, they're not things that have to be discovered. And I guess at the end of the day, it is nice to have them quantified and that we can point to a journal article and say, look, look, here it is in the science, black and white. The statistics spell it out for you. You can't deny Mm -hmm. that this is uh, some sort of cultural thing or that we're looking at things in a biased way. Like, here is the science peer reviewed. There is no arguing. And, And there absolutely is value in that. But 
the fact that we can't take action or we can't look at this from an, any sort of uh, solutions-based perspective until we have this here, at least in the United States, and the way that we approach these problems is, is frankly ridiculous. Um, but I'm getting very much off topic, I think, here. Well, it is, I think, important to kind of nail down because I think many people and our society in general is kind of stuck still on that social structural view of inequality. I think you hear a lot of people hold on to the perspective that, yes, there is still a great deal of people who are racist in our countries. Yes, people are greedy and we don't take care of people like we should. And yes, some people enjoy more advantages throughout life than others. But David, I don't know if enough people consider how one group of people being in poverty might actually be the source of enrichment for another group not just a coincidence. Another example is more Americans are supporting the idea that the rich need to be taxed, right? This is something that has uh, come up in the political discussions of our day. And many people are, are agreeing with that, that yes, we need to tax the rich. But the common arguments I hear follow along the lines of, you know, Jeff Bezos doesn't need that extra yacht, right? He's not going to miss one house out of the 20 he owns. And what about all those yacht jobs, Daniel? <laughs> exactly. Well, that gets into the nuanced argument. But the idea is like, yes, he, he worked hard and he got all this money, but that money could be used to help prevent people from starving in the streets. And, and wouldn't that just be a nicer way to spend that money, right? But this kind of just implies that billionaires like Bezos should be taxed because we could collectively use that money better, which in a way ignores the notion that Bezos is that rich only through the active and intentional theft from and exploitation of people now trapped in poverty. You can't have one without the other. And if we're not aware that great wealth is stolen through exploitation, we don't need to engage some complex philosophy and math formula to determine if it is right or wrong for Bezos to have the billions he does. And so that is why I think it's important for us to discuss this paper, because like you said, it does quantify, it does provide some hard facts for us to point to, to push back against this idea that these billions that are being made by the rich don't come at the expense of those in poverty. But we have this concept that we brought up several times on this show before, Daniel, and that's the fact that nothing is profitable. If we take into account all these environmental externalities, the things that we're doing to destroy the earth, to strip it of its resources, to poison our ecosystems, to kill all these animals and bring us to the brink of this mass extinction that we currently find ourselves in, well, all of that has a value. And though it may be hard to quantify initially on our quarterly accounting papers, it absolutely does. And that means that all this growth, the profit that we enjoy, well, it itself is imaginary. It's borrowing on the future life of this earth. And similarly to that, I want to extend this concept even further to not just the environmental and ecosystem and living damage that we've been doing to get this tricky accounting to make things look like we're profitable in the midst of this huge amount of growth, but also extend that down to the lives that each and every one of us lives and the suffering that exists because of this exploitation and because of this growth. The profit that we find in billionaires like Jeff Bezos, but even down to those of us who would be considered small business owners or property owners like these landlords is so often couched not just on the environmental destruction of this earth, but the destruction of the souls of all of us who live on this earth, ripping us apart individually as people, exploiting us, turning us into nothing more than labor of resources that could be extracted and ripped apart for somebody else's own gain, that's where we find ourselves. And this is nowhere more apparent than the world of landlords, of this rent-seeking that we see, where the only thing a landlord has to offer is the fact that for some reason, oftentimes through inheritance, because of no actions of their own, they happen to own a piece of property. And the fact that our property laws defend this above all else and gives this person essentially sovereignty over the way that we live our lives and the ability to end the way that we live our lives at any moment through this eviction process means that we are always on the brink of disaster. And this constant standing at the edge of precarity that can find us falling off into the depths of poverty is what leaves us so precarious in this day and age. And this is why we see all these diseases linked back to this constant threat. 
This is why we see people exploding in the numbers of the homeless out there. This is why we see dramatic increases in suicide and depression. This is why people are cast off, ripped apart from each other because they're forced out of their homes, forced away from their families because they have to find a place to live. And should you be so unlucky to fall outside of the good graces of this system, whether through evictions, whether through criminal convictions, then you will find yourself an outcast, a pariah, somebody searching for a place to call their own. And in that process, when you do find that home, you are going to be exploited even more because these landlords know that you are even more precariously positioned than anyone else and they can push you to the edges of your sanity, to milk you dry, to profit off the fact that they own a piece of property and you don't. And we all need a place to live. We all need food to eat. And the fact that we can't avoid those things allows somebody to step in and take advantage of us. This is not, at least in this nation, a question of lack of places to live. There are dramatically more empty homes and buildings in this country than there are people. It's not even close. We could house every single homeless person, every single person in this country in a home comfortably and still have access for the unhomed in dozens of other countries around the world. It's not a problem of supply and demand. It's a problem of greed. It's a problem of seeing how far we can push each other to exploit each other. And that is the housing crisis. Well put, David. And (laughs) I want to remind the listener that uh, there's a little bit of hope at the end of this episode. So, you know, if you you feel a little hopeless after after that, uh, stick around. But you did mention that nothing is profitable. And to kind of showcase an example of that in this landlord context. It was pointed out in this article that back in post-war America, when housing was explicitly segregated along racial lines, Black people spent as much as 50% more in rent than white people in similar buildings, right? But even worse than that, landlords effectively created slums. The slums didn't emerge naturally. Landlords created them by purchasing the properties that were the only places a black family could live legally. And then the landlord would subdivide those properties so that they could stuff more people inside them. And then they would charge higher rents on these units than they were in comparable white buildings. While at the same time, these landlords allowed the properties to dilapidate, creating a slum-like environment so that they could save on maintenance costs. And eventually, Because these properties lost value through this dilapidation process, the landlord saved on taxes as the property values plummeted. And we've mentioned in the past, David, how the World Bank itself calls slums a sign of progress. There's an article on the World Bank's website that literally says that slums, which are made of makeshift shacks, according to the World Bank, lack basic services like water. There are places in which tenants can be evicted at a moment's notice, and yet somehow this allows them to be better off than in rural areas, to quote the World Bank, and that these places do help people to get ahead. Okay, well, here's some some numbers, Daniel. I know I was just super light on anything except uh, opinion and passion a second ago, so let me redeem myself with some facts here. All these numbers come from data that is in a national U.S. rental housing finance survey as well as detailed data from Milwaukee's housing market in which over 1,000 tenants were interviewed over a three-year period, as well as apartment landlords who were surveyed about their costs. So what they found is that in poor neighborhoods where the poverty rate is greater than 50%, tenants are paying more than double the so-called exploitation rate, which they define as the ratio of rental rates to property values. So what that means is in a richer area, tenants may only pay an annual rent equal to 10% of the property value. But the poor are paying closer to 25% of what the entire property is worth with their annual rent. And the same discrepancy is observed in neighborhoods that are majority black compared to neighborhoods that are minority black. To quote from the paper, renters in poor and predominantly black neighborhoods do pay more for housing relative to its property value. Poverty has a particularly large association with exploitation in Milwaukee, but the same general pattern holds nationally, end quote. So yes, the poor do pay more. But another important question is, do landlords themselves make more profit off the poor? And that's where things get evil, right? But unfortunately, again, the answer is yes. 
Comparing data on apartment buildings, the data shows that while there's only a small difference in the nominal rent that tenants pay, buildings in poor neighborhoods have up to three times lower taxes. They're often purchased outright at distressed prices and therefore incur no mortgage costs. And landlords enjoy lower maintenance and management costs, in part because they offer fewer services like keeping sidewalks clear of snow. In Milwaukee specifically, a rental unit in a poor neighborhood can earn $318 in monthly profit, while a unit in a more affluent region earns less than $150 in monthly profit. So that means, in a nutshell, it's actually more profitable to exploit the poor than it is to exploit the rich. And part of that is because the rich are more mobile, they have more uh, advantages in terms of looking for a reasonable deal to them, and poor people oftentimes don't have that luxury and so are just ripe, as I said, to be exploited. However, there is an important caveat to these trends. Milwaukee is a low-cost housing market and landlords make more money from the poor because the costs of operating those buildings are lower. But in super high-cost housing markets, such as my own New York City, Landlords make less money from poor tenants because of the higher rent that they could charge, and because their properties experience rising values, which increase their taxes. So we mentioned in last week's episode how New York City landlords are interested in using surveillance to kick their tenants out of rent-stabilized buildings so they can participate in gentrification and higher rents. So uh, with that in mind, I think we can generalize landlord intentions here into two strategies, which is one, in poor and low-cost areas, landlords make more money by keeping tenants poor and underserviced. And in two, these rich, high-cost areas like here in New York City, landlords make more money by eliminating poor people from their properties. In both cases, getting rich by owning apartments is a function of a landlord's relation to exploiting the poor. Whether that relation is either conscious in terms of the direct exploitation or something more secondary in the way of trying to remove them from the equation so that they can take advantage of these higher rents that the markets will support. I think this is a good moment to take a pause here. Take a step back, David, because I think it would be unfair to simply point the finger at landlords and say, this group, this class is evil and exploitative. I mean, yes, that may be true in certain cases, in a lot of cases even. But again, I'm typically coming from the perspective that individuals will always be replaced in the same roles so long as the economic and political structures for those roles exist. So let's talk for just one minute before we get to the interview, which I'm really eager to do. But I just want to touch real quick on economics, assumptions, and models. There's a book called Debunking Economics. And I like it because the author breaks down the models being taught in most economics curriculums at universities, specifically what's known as neoclassical economics. And then he explains why these models are broken and wrong, which is great because I took macro and microeconomics in college, and I have to agree that it's mostly complete nonsense. And, and I really love seeing somebody break down that nonsense the way he does. A simple example, one of the most fundamental models to neoclassical economics is the idea of supply and demand. You're taught day one in microeconomics that the price of a good is established by the intersection of a producer's incentive to make that good at a certain price and a buyer's incentive to purchase that good at a certain price. That means that as the price of a good rises, a producer is willing to make a higher quantity of that good. But at the same time, a rising price means a consumer is willing to buy less and less. So the equilibrium price will be where these two competing desires intersect. But then you'll pass that class and, and you'll go to macroeconomics, which will step in and say, to determine how supply and demand functions at the scale of the entire economy, not just these individual consumers and producers, all you have to do is just add up all these supply and demand curves for every individual and voila, you have the same model just made up of every individual. Now, this, as Steve Keen points out in his book, is a massive failure because What's true for a single individual immediately breaks down when you add more variables and consider the economy as a complex system because supply costs and prices no longer exist in isolation. As prices change, people's income changes, which directly impacts what they are willing to spend. And similarly, production costs change in a non-linear way depending on how much is being produced. So 
there are certainly many instances in the economy where you can have rising prices and at the same time rising demand for those goods or even falling production of those goods. And the long story short is that the economy is a highly complex system, right? There's a lot of moving parts. They each impact each other and other moving parts in these totally unpredictable and chaotic ways. And the simplification of this system by economists is what has in part led to economic crises like the housing market crash of 2008. Now to expand just a bit on that, another key concept in neoclassical economics is that financial markets are efficient, meaning that investors for the most part have the same information as every other investor. And since financial values are determined by information, assets like company stocks, house values, mortgage contracts, all these things, according to economics, should be priced according to their true value because all the investors determining that price are making their assumptions on the same information, on the same formulas. And it is on this assumption, this flawed assumption, that free market proponents have pushed for and successfully caused sweeping deregulation of financial markets because finance has been reduced to a simple model of valuation as opposed to an actual influencer of values in the first place, which is what finance so often is. Housing values exploded to unsustainable levels leading up to the crash, the stock market, the the mortgage crash, directly because of financial speculation. Now, I know it sounds like I'm rambling a bit here, and maybe I am, but the point is modern neoclassical economics attempts to reduce the economy to simple models that don't take into account how, as a complex system, prices, finance, costs, incomes, these all influence one another. So to bring it back to this topic of this housing market crisis, there's another fundamental assumption, uh, uh, an economic model that is presented to us, and that is of risk and return, right? We've all heard this, and it's a simple idea, right? the, The idea is that the more risk that is inherent in a particular investment, the more an investor will seek to be compensated for that risk, for taking on that risk because of the probability for loss. But in the context of housing, that means that landlords will charge poor people more money relative to the value of their property, like we talked about. That They're charging poor people more money than more well-off people because poor people are considered to be at a greater risk of not being able to pay their rent. Now, if, if you follow these simple economic models, that makes perfectly sense. You'll never bat an eye at that. And that's why those landlords on bigger pockets don't think there's anything wrong with this idea that they would never rent to someone who has had an issue at some point in their past. But we should stop and think about this in light of what we've talked about, these positive feedback loops of poverty. Just think about for a moment here that poor people are being charged more. And this is nothing new. We discussed predatory lending and vulture funds in episode 59, Bankrupt Ethics, but they're being charged more precisely because they have a more difficult time paying, which means that a landlord seeking higher compensation is actually creating the risk as much as he or she is responding to it. And that's really important because so often these economic models are presented to us as if the the actor in this situation isn't actually influencing anything, but merely responding to some law of economics, right? The law of the market. But in fact, we see that landlords are the ones creating that risk for the tenants in the first place. This exploitative relationship is what creates that precarity, that financial insecurity. And then that, of course, leads to those higher eviction rates, which then go on permanent records, which makes it harder for those tenants to have housing, which makes it harder for them to keep a job, which means they can't afford transportation, which means they can't get to where they need to go to get the money to pay the rent. And we see how this risk spirals out to no fault of that tenant. But as you pointed out, David, these landlords, if they were truly taking on more risk, then in totality and aggregate, we should see they would not be making so much more profit than these more stable investments, because that risk should balance out, that risk should take away from the profits of other landlords in this system. But the fact that they continue to profit means that something is going, something is amiss here. And what is amiss is that that risk is being put on society. That risk is being put on the tenant. Yes, there is risk in investing in these properties, but it's not being felt by the landlord because the landlord just 
compensates for that risk by charging everybody more. And then when we find out that we have homelessness problems, when we find out we have crime problems, we find out we have people who can't afford to live and we have to create communities around just getting people fed. These, these are costs that we as society bear. It's directly because that landlord, this economic relationship has created those problems by forcing people out of their homes. But again, I think we're still pointing the fingers at these landlords. And at the end of the day, the investors create the risk that those in poverty experience But that doesn't necessarily explain why these landlords, why these investors exist in this exploitative relationship in the first place. And to do that, we would have to rethink in the first place the very structure of basic property ownership rights. This thing that has been embedded in our consciousness that seems to be an immutable fact of or law of our economy. But in reality, there's there can be a better way. And you know, we could talk about, David, all these, these tenants' rights movements popping up in Boston and Denver and in California, Rhode Island, Oregon, Minnesota, all these tenants coming together to fight their landlords and to, to demand a better way and a different way of considering property ownership. Well, l- let's not get ahead of ourselves here, though, Daniel, because while we are happy to ramble on about this at all points, uh, we have in just a moment an expert here somebody who's really in this even more than we are who can talk to us about this. Because when it comes to talking about all this stuff, these theory, these statistics, uh, it's easy to get lost from people who are actually doing work on the ground of the lives that are being touched by this all every day. So instead, let's talk, like I said, to somebody on the ground. And without further ado, let's turn to Claire. All right. uh, Are we all three of us on the call? Let's see. Here, it's, this is David. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, David. So we got Claire on the phone. Claire has been involved in the uh, tenants' right movement in California for some time now. How are you doing, Claire? Um, I'm doing good today. Thank you for having me on, y'all. Well, tell us a little bit about um, the struggle that you've been involved in, how long, and, and what's going on. Yeah, so um, I am out in Santa Cruz, California. Uh, I'm in my early 20s, and I've been doing different kinds of political organizing since 2016. Um, And then in 2017, I got involved in the tenants movement here, just as it was starting to get fired up. Um, I got involved because Santa Cruz is the fourth least affordable city to live in in the world in terms of how much money people make Mm -hmm. versus uh, how much the average rent cost is. Um, And we're the least affordable city in the country due to that. Um, and so everyone in town feels it, feels the weight of, Mm -hmm. of their rent prices, of their housing situation. Um, and I grew up here and so I've just seen most of my friends have to move away. I'm constantly seeing people suffer trauma from their housing situation because they're forced to stay somewhere they don't want to, or forced to leave their home when they don't want to. Um, and I got into tenant organizing because me and some folks that were fired up about this, um, spoke to some organizers from the LA Tenants Union <clears throat> and they, you know, explained the difference between just kind of this vague idea of doing work around housing and actual tenant organizing. Um, and so what tenant organizing is, is it has a distinct focus on tenant rights and the relationship between a landlord and a tenant and the identity of a tenant. Um, and so we define the identity of a tenant as somebody who does not control their housing situation. So it's not just people that we think of usually as renters, um, but somebody who lives with a family member because they can't afford to move out, somebody who's in prison, somebody who is homeless. These are all people that don't actually control their housing situation. Um, And so all the people working on this, we were all tenants, um, and that made a lot of sense to us. And we decided to start to figure out what doing tenant organizing would look like. Um, and we started meeting other people in the community that were already doing this work. There was, uh, I'm not going to say names on here, but there was folks that mm-hmm. uh, deserve a huge shout out and a ton of credit for having been doing tenant organizing for years before we got into it. People who ran tenants rights hotlines and stuff like that. There was other groups just starting to get into it in 2017. They were focusing on canvassing a lot of them and knocking on doors every single week to get their neighbors together to figure out what the, uh, biggest concerns in their neighborhood was, and it was always rent prices. It always went to the top of the list. 
And so all of these different groups trying to figure out tenant organizing um, started coming together and coordinating a bit more. Uh, myself and people I was working with were knocking on tenants' doors and asking, you know, we're also tenants. Do you have any problems with your living situation? Um, would you be interested in you know, doing something about that, about your landlord not fixing problems, about how high your rent prices are? And over time, all of these different kinds of work coalesced into a rent control campaign um, in late 2017. And so we actually, uh, a whole bunch of Santa Cruz tenants got together and wrote a piece of policy, uh, a tenant protections bill that includes uh, rent control and what's called just what are called just cause eviction protections, um, and ran a grassroots campaign from scratch. And I don't want to talk only about that campaign or too much about it, um, but I definitely, yeah, yeah, we definitely like learned a lot from that. Yeah, a couple of things stood out to me. Number one, you know, I remember David, you mentioning, I think it was like episode, what can we do? how we hear the word organizing and it's kind of scary. You know, it's like, it, it seems official. It sounds like you need a lot of experience. Mm -hmm. And the point David made is organizations usually are formed by people just doing things and the, the organizations and the structures kind of come later. And it sounds like this is similar what happened to your group in California, just neighbors going door to door saying, hey, look, we've all had problems with landlords. Do you have the similar problems? Let's do something about it. And it was later that the the structure emerged and the you know plans to to uh, fight for legislation is that about right? Yeah, I mean that's totally right. Um, and whenever this stuff happens, there's going to be people involved that have more or less experience with you know scary organizing. Um, but the you know no no movement starts without just like a bunch of people that have no experience deciding they want to do something about it. Mm -hmm. And especially I've seen with tenant work, that is where people you know are coming into the movement with basically no experience and just like a lot of energy and frustration with their housing situation. Right. Um, another thing I thought was interesting. So you, you kind of redefine what a tenant is, you know, versus a renter. And so the people you're dealing with, the people who are organizing seem to be in a state of vulnerability. Is that right? Yeah. And I'm curious in, in that situation, are landlords taking advantage of these people in ways that they're not with with people who are not so vulnerable or are they just caught up in, you know, the general housing market that just is unfavorable to people who are not financially secure or is there something, is there something else going on? I think that's a great question. And like the tenant landlord relationship is such an important thing to focus on here. And this, this comes up a lot in this work, but you know, a lot of times what will happen is a big fight when there's something like a rent control fight, there'll be a big argument like, that the renters are calling everyone bad landlords and saying they're all taking advantage of the of the renters. And, you know, the tenants will say, you know, look, it's actually a lot more complicated than that. Landlords have been set up to, like, take advantage and exploit tenants. That is the role that they've been put in. And it's not necessarily, they didn't just wake up one day like, oh, I want to go oppress some people. <laughs> um, that's not how our system works, right? They inherited some property or they just decided that this was the way that they're going to guarantee their retirement or whatever. Um, and that put them in an economic position where they have control over another person's housing situation mm -hmm. and their interests are uh, contradictory to that of a tenant. It's like your boss at, at a job is always going to have interests that are contradictory to yours. No matter how nice of a person they are, at some point, what you need to survive is going to go up against how they make their income. Right. Um, and, and there are, you know, there was landlords involved in the rent control fight. There was landlords that saw this messed up contradiction and were like, I'm going to do everything I can to make this more fair. Um, and I think that's that's really important that we have those allies. And then there are really bad landlords, right? There's there's sure. people that I would call evil that, you know, ended up in the position of a landlord. Um, there's there's one guy in particular who I'm happy to say his name on this podcast, Darius Mosinen. He owns 50-something properties in Santa Cruz. He is a, you know, a huge racist. He made very racist flyers during the rent control campaign, basically saying that rent control would bring a bunch of... Uh, Latinx immigrants into the community and putting out flyers of Latinx people as criminals, like, oh, meet your new neighbors. Um, you know, there, there, there's there's landlords like him where it got to the point where we had to have a march against him. Um, Darius, you're not being a good neighbor in this situation. <laughs> yeah, Darius is not being a good neighbor, correct. I don't want Darius as my neighbor. Meet my new neighbor. Um, so, you know, there's always going to be, there's always going to be ones like that. But the important thing to be clear on is no matter how like good of a person a landlord might be, they're in a position of economic power over a tenant. Um, and right. that, you know, that, that's a messed up thing in and of itself. 
Well, we, uh, I was just chatting with David before we jumped on the call. And I think what your point about, it's not necessarily that all these individuals are evil, but they're in this structure that kind of forces them to play this role. And I was a little bit surprised, but actually not surprised that a lot of our property law in the United States was built on old English codes or modeled after these codes, including things like absolute liability for rent, which meant that a tenant was responsible 100% for rent, even if the property were to burn down or something like that. And I guess in many ways, we're still you know, living with that legal legacy and trying to reshape our whole notion of, of what property right and property law should look like. Mm, yeah, yeah. I mean, that legacy is very, very felt. Um, especially in places where the housing crisis are worse. Um, I was actually talking to my mom during the rent control campaign, and she was a supporter of it. And but she was like, you know, she knows knew a lot of people that weren't, and she was like, you know, look, I think the hard thing here is that you're actually ha- making all of these people that have never thought about this have to reframe how they think about property rights yeah. versus you know human dignity and 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 people's like inherent right to have a, a you know safe, healthy place to live. Yeah, and. And a lot of why our thoughts on property rights are messed up is because the law has just been like always protecting the property owner for so long. Well, that's that's actually interesting. So the way you you made it sound like organizing with tenants, you know, just going door to door saying, "Hey, do you have a problem with your landlord? Let's organize." It seems pretty straightforward, and it seems like I mean, who wouldn't jump on that, right? Who's not angry about the rent that they have to pay? But at the same time. Me over here on the East Coast, I don't know about New York. Uh, I don't know about David in New York. I know they're. I can speak to that in just a second. Yeah. yeah. Um, but for me, the idea of tenant organizing is something I've never grew up hearing about. And I'm wondering are there challenges going door to door and trying to have this discussion? Do, do tenants push back even if they're clearly in this exploitative situation? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's really hard. And I, I don't want to make it sound like it's as easy as going door to door and suddenly everyone's together in a movement. Sure. Um, we, ha- we have the benefit, you know, not the, I don't want to say the benefit, but we're in a place where the contradictions are really high because of how bad the rent situation is, which I think uh, gave us a leg up in getting people out the door. But there's a ton of challenges. Um, I think one of the biggest ones just goes back to like how isolated we all are and how mm. hard it is in our society, especially like in the, in the U S uh, how hard it is to imagine like just the concept of acting collectively. Right. And, you know, for many working people, it's gotten to a point where we like don't see a way out. We can't imagine what a better world would to live in would look and feel like. So like organizing with your neighbors is a really foreign concept, um, especially if you don't know your neighbors. And so we've definitely gotten a lot of people at the doors who are, you know, they're suspicious of us. Um, they don't know what we're trying to sell them. Many times they think we work for the landlord um, and they're in such a vulnerable position. They think this is a trap. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, one of the challenges is if you're knocking on doors that aren't, you know, it's not like in an apartment complex you live in. It's not somebody you already have a relationship with. Just like that lack of trust definitely prevents people from, from stepping into it. And one thing the rent control campaign did do well was give people a sense that there was like a legitimate thing happening that they could be a part of. Whereas going door to door and being like, hey, we're just a group of tenants trying to do something about this. It feels less real to people, right? Um, And so, I mean, that's a big challenge. People who are tenants also work full time, basically all of them. And if they don't, there's usually a reason for that that also prevents them from putting a lot of time and energy into a project. And so people will cite time, they'll cite their children, they'll cite all these reasons that they don't, they're not able to get involved. Um, and then the threat of retribution from your landlord is really, really real. Um, there's There are laws in place that protect you when you're organizing tenants, um, but the, the laws don't protect tenants already, right? People already feel like tenant laws and doing them a lot of good. So even if you tell them, look, you have laws that protect you if you come to this meeting, they would rather not take the risk. Well, the big thing that we've run into here, so I, I do some work with the uh, Ridgewood Tenants Union which is uh, oftentimes meets literally right outside my door, which is helpful. We put up posters and that's a great way to organize people. They have rallies on street corners Um, and and people get interested, but oftentimes fall out and don't end up following through. And uh, New York is, we have a lot of strong renters laws. Uh, We we do have rent control. We do have rent stabilization, though uh, they're hard to get into and there's lots of loopholes and things. Uh, so we, we do have a strong tenants law. 
base already, but uh, they're also very strong in formal networks that the landlords run with themselves. And you can end up on what are basically blacklists that landlords share among each other, oftentimes illegally. Uh, but if your name ends up on that, then it becomes very hard to rent in this city if you, uh, for whatever reason, lose out on your lease at the moment. So trying to come over these, these informal networks of power, these informal balances of power is another big thing that, that people are always uh, asking us, well, what happens if I end up on this list? And uh, we unfortunately right now don't have great answers to that because these lists really shouldn't exist in the first place. Um, but, but reminding everybody, you know, that, that, that coming together and uh, if, if everyone is working on this, the solidarity that comes from these communities coming together uh, puts a lot of that power that landlords have in being able to target individuals aside. Um, it's much harder to target groups of people than it is single people. Yep. hundred um, percent. That, and I'm, I'm sorry that's happening though. That's, that's just really awful. Um, during and after our rent control campaign, there was plenty of evictions of organizers and it's really hard to prove intent on some of these things, mm -hmm. you know, cause it's not always just like an eviction in the middle of the lease. It's like up your leases up and you're all out. And I'm not going to tell you why. And so like that, that kind of retribution is, is scary and common. Um, and you're totally right, David, that the only way that we're going to fight that and, and make any of this better is together. Yeah. Um, do you have any, let's say like, uh, best practices or, or blueprints if, if I'm here in Atlanta and I live in an apartment building and this is all new to me, but it sounds good. Are there any do's or don'ts to tenant organizing? Um, you know, I'm sure there are like local organizations or national organizations that someone could contact in terms of getting, you know, potential pro bono or legal help. But I mean, what do you think are some of the most important steps to take if, if someone's about to embark on this organizing uh, journey? Yeah, I, I definitely want to speak to that. Um, so the first thing I want to name is just sort of a, like a, like a maxim to carry into this work. And that is, as you start doing it, you need to strike a balance between developing actual relationships with people, especially your neighbors and people that you share a landlord with, um, and learning your, your rights, your fellow tenants' rights, the legal ramifications of organizing, all of that stuff. And the reason you need to strike a balance is because you absolutely need to be organizing with other people. Just knowing all the law won't do everything that you need to. Knowledge is not the same as power. Like organized people is what will give you that power. Um, but on the other hand, like if you don't know the laws, you won't be able to explain the true risk to people. And when it comes down to it, so many of these tenant fights, um, the victories that we get are won by a landlord breaking the law and tenants proving. Mm. There's tons of there's tons of stuff that exists outside the legal realm. We need to be careful about leaning too heavily on this law that is totally against our favor right. um, and this legal system that is just stacked against us, you know, in terms of the quality of lawyers that landlords get and just how, how everything's written. So it's like not falling too far into leaning on the law um, and making sure that we're organizing fellow people, but also making sure we know the law and can talk to people about. So I'll start with like learning the law. Um, it depends on the state you're in. Um, so I'm not going to go into like specific laws and stuff because it varies state by state. I believe that most states have a guide on tenants' rights um, somewhere on their state website. I know California does. Um, and you can just look up like, you know, California Tenants' Rights Guide, and it's pretty easy to find. Um, a non-governmental website for this is NOLO, N-O-L-O dot com. They have great, great tenants' rights guides. I'm not sure that they have every single state, but I know they kind of have overall laws, and they have them for a lot of states. Um, for most people, unless you have a legal background, I would not suggest just pulling up the tenant law and reading the legal code. It's very, very hard to actually piece things together, in my experience. And then something that is going to be immensely helpful is, like you mentioned, Daniel, um, looking for a, a legal aid organization. And this doesn't always just have to be like a tenant law organization. Um, in Santa Cruz, we have something called the California Rural Legal Assistance, and they provide free legal aid in rural areas to um, anyone that's under a certain, uh, like, like basically the poverty line or whatever, under a certain income amount. There's also a similar organization for seniors, for people over 65 years old. And so if you look up like free legal aid organization, uh, it's very likely that you can find somebody to get in touch with and just tell them you want to learn about this stuff. Um, some will be more interested than, than others in, in helping you if you're just trying to learn about this. But if you have a specific problem they, um, and you qualify, you generally get a lot of help straight from a lawyer. 
Um, another thing to look for is tenants' rights organizations in your area. A big thing that tenants' rights organizations do is have workshops on your rights. And also, if you're in California, and I think everyone should check this out, actually, because they're great organizations, but especially if you're in California, looking at the LA Tenants Union website and the San Francisco Tenants Union website, they both have great, great explanations of your rights as a tenant. Um, I think some of it is specific to their local jurisdiction, but for the most part, those are just really great guides and great organizations. And then, like, I would say that as you find these resources, that's a great place to start to bring one of your fellow or a few of your fellow tenants in to learn these things. And what I've seen be a really effective way to do that is if there's a specific thing going on, like your landlord is refusing to answer your text to them about fixing your pipes that keep leaking, uh-huh. like make that the focus of your project. Like decide like, this is the problem we're having. I want to find out what the landlord's responsibility is here. You know, get a couple of your neighbors together, anyone you know that's in this with you and, and, you know, make a collective process out of learning the legal rights. Yeah, that that sounds like the perfect strategy to me is like have a common problem, then just get get some people who care about that problem together to talk about it. And through that process, you'll naturally get to know each other, you'll build trust, and all of a sudden that second problem when it crops up, now there's you know, the group has more confidence, has more experience going about it. And I can see how the responsibilities would just expand from there and the ability to fight even bigger problems would grow through that type of relationship building. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And so building the relationships is harder. I'm just going to be real about that. Um, and a lot of the way most of us have been socialized is like, Oh, it's, I can go research this thing and do this thing on my own, but meeting new people is scary and hard. Like that's, that's really valid. Yeah. So my experience is it's always harder, um, organizing people that aren't your neighbors that don't share a landlord with you that you can't say like, look, I'm your neighbor and, you know, he never fixes the pipes, huh? Um, like that always, that connection right there makes it a lot easier. Um, but that being said, that is something you can do is go organize tenants somewhere else. But if you live somewhere where you and other tenants are having any kinds of problem with your landlord, even if it's just high rent, which is a serious problem in and of itself, having some kind of social gathering or, or a series of them, like a dinner, a barbecue, a night at the bar, if you have children, like getting the children together to hang out, those are all a really good space to express complaints and a desire to address those issues together. And, you know, it doesn't have to be something that you do dishonestly. You can, you can tell people up front, like, look, I think we all need to get to know each other better. And part of that reason is that I'm having some concerns about this complex we live in. Mm-hmm. That's up to you, like how you approach that. Uh, but generally making it an actual social event too, not making it all about talking about this situation. But if you want to be working with your neighbors, you got to get to know them as people. You got to get to know where they came from and why they might, you know, care about staying in their housing situation or having a better situation so much. And I will say that, like, if there's a, a very serious problem, like everyone in the building just got a rent increase, that is a time to, to move very quickly because that is a time where you're much more likely to get people together. Um, and I have seen, like, one fired up person organize all of their neighbors in, in a complex uh, very, very quickly when everyone gets a rent increase because yeah. they don't realize that every single person got one. So um, and that's what I've seen. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Um, well, that reminded me one thing that happened to me, this was like a year or two ago, and I wish I had been in a different frame of mind, but I was living in an apartment building and it got taken over by a new owner and we were using an automated system to pay the rent. And when the new owner t- came on, that automated system just mysteriously stopped working for like a month and, and no one was notified. And of course, my rent payment was late because I didn't know. And I got a letter on my door saying, you know, you owe rent plus here's $500 of late fees or you're going to be evicted. Oh my God. I was like, what's going on? So of course I go to the management office and I'm talking to them and I'm really fighting them on this. I'm saying, this is ridiculous. You know, this is y'all's fault or whatever. And eventually they, they've said, fine, just pay your rent and we'll, you know, it'll go away. But I noticed when I was having that fight with them, there were other people coming in to have that same argument and agents would kind of push them into different rooms and tell them, Hey, Mm -hmm. and I could see like mothers like really upset about this. And we're just giving up and just paying because the threat of being kicked out was so unthinkable that they just kind of gave in. And I realized, you know, what if I had just gone around door to door and said, Hey, I see it. Saw you got that letter on your door. I got the same thing. This is not right. Let's go in together. And instead of having that small victory for myself that wasted two days, but 
you know, avoided that late payment, I could have maybe helped somebody else in that process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That would have been like a really key moment. I think, um, a really, a really like effective moment to get together and have people all respond as one. And it makes such a, such a big difference. If just a few of the tenants or if all of the tenants or most get together, um, and speak to a problem. And so, yeah, I think when building these relationships, like being aware that like, once you get together, like I said earlier, you can learn your rights together. Um, if you know the law is being broken or you just really feel that the thing happening is unfair, you can write your landlord a letter saying so and have everyone who's on board contact or, I mean, uh, sign that letter. Um, and that doesn't mean everyone has to be in a meeting together. What I've seen work is you get maybe half the tenants together at a meeting and then you go, you, you draft a letter and then you go door to door and say, all I'm asking for you is to sign your name on this letter. We're sending it. We're saying this increase is unfair. This new automated system screwed us over or whatever. And writing that letter tells the landlord that you are all now standing together. And that in many cases, uh, especially if the law is being broken, is enough to to like actually get the landlord to pull back. And if it isn't, you've done the first step in basically forming like a tenant association, which is the, the legal definition of a um, group of organized tenants. And so under tenant law, um, at least in California, is what I'll speak to, um, if you have some record of having organized for your tenants' rights together, and that record could look like an email confirming that you're all meeting or you all just met. Uh-huh. It could look like a paper sign-in sheet that you all filled out. If you have some physical record that you all got together to organize your tenants' rights, you are now considered a tenants' association under tenant law and retribution against you for having formed that association, for being talking about your rights, is completely illegal. Gotcha. And so stuff that happens after that, if you can prove that you had all, you had all met and been talking about this, it puts the landlord in a really, really risky position to be trying to evict people, to be trying to raise rents and harassing people. I'm not going to say that that law will always protect people. Because again, it's just, it's not built for us. But I think getting people to that point where you are legally considered a tenants association is, is really, really key. Uh, one more thing I want to say about getting people together, and I think this is really key, is I wouldn't make it always about just the just fighting the landlord on these problems because there's you know things in this world that we need to be fighting absolutely and there's also like a positive vision of what we can be doing for each other if we build these relationships Mm -hmm. and so if you get everyone together what you'll generally learn is that there's also problems that your neighbors are having that you yourself and your other neighbors can address um somebody might not be able to clean their apartment for one reason or another and you can make a day out of having neighbors clean their apartment or cook them food or wash their kids for a day you know there's there's a lot of uh, forms of mutual aid that people need. And if you start meeting that together as neighbors, like that's a huge part of what tenants organizations actually do besides fighting their landlord um, and fighting for tenants' rights is just helping each other. Um, and I think that will build relationships more effectively than anything else I've named, right? Yeah. Yeah, those are all great points. Um, I think you've left a lot uh, for our listeners to think about and chew on. Is there anything else you'd like to say, Claire, before we, uh, before we let you go? Yeah, yeah, there definitely is. Um, I'll do a shorter version of this. So yeah, I just wanted to name that like when we're in, when we're in these living situations, when our rent is high, when our washing machine doesn't work, we have mold, rats, or God forbid, an eviction notice. Like it's really easy to accept this as just how things are, or even worse, think that like we deserve it for not being, for not working hard enough for being successful. And like, that is the mindset that I want everyone to break out of, that we all need to break out of. And it's really, really scary to fight when we get an eviction notice. It's, it's, it's scary when we have so much else going on and so much is at stake. And so I don't blame people when we don't fight, but we aren't living in a vacuum and none of us are in this alone. And every time we let an unfair eviction go through, every time we don't get our problems fixed by our landlords um, and we just let these things slide, that gives these people who profit off of how we are living like more power over the next person more mm. power over their other tenants and it lets the system continue and it leaves people that are already fighting with less allies. And so we need to understand as tenants that like we're on the front lines of a sort of battle, whether we choose to engage in it or not. And we are in this together, whether we choose to engage in it or not. And so at some point we need to say like, enough is enough. I'm learning the law. I'm asking my neighbors if they got a notice to I'm emailing the local news, I'm joining the local tenants union, mm. like brave people across the world are doing this right now. And it's making a difference. And every single little act of resistance is an act of bravery and compassion for ourselves, for our neighbors, for everyone in this housing market. 
And the key thing for me is like in doing this, we break out of this isolation. Yeah. Um, and the people I've met through this work are some of my dearest friends. And these are people who I'm going to cherish my relationship with as long as I live. And as somebody who spent like much of my life struggling with isolation and addiction and depression, it's this kind of work that saved me from that and saved my life and let me feel like a whole person again. And so that's what I'd love to leave the listeners with is I don't think there's any stronger encouragement than that. Like, a chance to break out of our isolation and a chance to like support our fellow neighbors um, in this really, really messed up world. I think that's such a, such an amazing point. And I, I really appreciate you bringing that up because, you know, we did an episode specifically on isolation and you've talked about that a bit here. That was ex- episode 62 separate ways. And, you know, I think so often we feel helpless, you know, it's like, I'm lonely and I'm, ha- on, I'm unhappy. How can I solve that problem? But so often we can't solve that by pursuing it directly. It's through doing something else. It's through this organizing. It's through collecting around a common problem that all of a sudden we realize that through that process, oh, wait, we're not lonely anymore because we have a common struggle. And another reason why I think it's great you brought that up is a lot of people give up before trying something like this because they look at the opposition. They say, how am I going to win? against a landlord that owns 50 apartment buildings mm. in my state and a thousand across the country and has the law and all these, uh, this army of attorneys behind them. And the truth is maybe you won't completely win. Maybe you won't pass that legislation, but if in the process you create a community that is now aware of this common opposition, you might discover that you've solved a whole host of other problems that you didn't set out to solve, right? But just the type of things that get done and go away when there's a a community that's now responsible to and for each other and cares about each other. And so I think that's, that's something also worth thinking about going forward. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't have said it better myself. Um, You know, like I I appreciate this show so much to people listening because there's so much weight to process in in all of your episodes about the way our world is broken and like coming out of that the other side with some hope is really really hard but the only people that benefit from us losing hope are those that are already running things right the people that don't even need help yes Um, and so if people take anything from this interview i just want it to be some fucking hope because i believe a better world is possible like i can feel that in my bones and there's so many ways to contribute to creating it and so I, I really believe the people listening to this, the two of you making this show are going to be instrumental in building that world. So all my love and respect goes out to the two of you and the people who choose to just like imagine a better way of living. Well, at the end of the day, no one's doing the more important work than people like you, Claire, out there on the streets making it happen. So thank you for that work and for inspiring us to uh, do the same. Yeah, thank you so much. I uh, can't wait to hear the episode. All right. Have a good one. Have a lovely day. Thanks so much, Claire. Yeah, bye, David. I think that conversation, David, leaves us with more than enough to consider in terms of what we all can do. And so I suppose that's a lot for us to think about going forward. As always, Daniel. But think about it. We hope you will. You can find out more about all the topics we've covered in this episode, find links to those two papers as well as the rest of our sources, and read a full transcript of this show on our website at ashesashes.org. A lot of time and research goes into making these episodes possible, and we will never use ads to support this show. So if you like it, would like us to keep going, you, our listener, can support us by giving us a review, recommending us to a friend, carrying these discussions on with you into your community, and you can support us directly on patreon.com slash ashesashescast. And we do have an email address. It's contact at ashesashes.org. And we encourage you to send us your thoughts. We read them all. And sorry, sometimes we uh, take a while to get back to you. But that doesn't mean we're not thinking of you. We're also on all your favorite social media networks at Ashes Ashes Cast. Next week, we've got a great episode taking us back to the first topic we've ever covered on this show. Sea ice, the Arctic, the North and the disaster that's slowly unfolding up there. So we hope you'll tune in for that. It's very important topics, and it's sure to be an interesting show. But until then, this is Ashes Ashes. Bye. Bye Bye-bye.